Hello and welcome back to the channel guys. In this short video, we will be discussing about panics in Go. So the first thing we need to understand here is that there are no exceptions whatsoever in Go. And why is that? That is because exceptional situations are considered pretty normal in Go. You know, because um, let's take an example. Uh, opening a file that does not exist is reasonable. It can happen. Developers can do that. And it's, it's nothing exceptional. It happens all the time. So uh, errors are returned by Go to handle such situations. And the responsibility uh, of handling such situations is on the developer. If they want, they can simply uh, kill and exit the program if uh, something like this happens. Say an error happens while uh, trying to read a file which doesn't exist or say an error happens uh, while trying to open a file that doesn't exist. Now it's up to the developer to decide whether he wants to continue to run the program uh, or he wants to exit and you know completely uh, stop running the program. Okay, so uh, but still uh, we should note that sometimes a Go program simply cannot figure out what to do and it uh, cannot continue to run in such situations and uh, such a situation is called a panic in Go. Let's head over to the Go Playground to see an example of the same. All right, so what do we have here? We have here two variables, A and B equal to 10 and one respectively. And in the next line, we are trying to divide A by B and we see the output of 10. Uh, what we'll do next is simply uh, replace the one uh, with a zero, which means B becomes zero and we are trying to divide 10 by zero which uh, as you all know is not possible because division by zero doesn't make sense. When I try to run this program, we see that our application has panicked and we see that we get a runtime error, integer divided by zero. And here is the stack trace. Uh, it happened at proc.go line number 12, which is this line. So here, because our Go application did not know what to do when we have a runtime error of dividing something by zero, the application started panicking. This panic flowed up to the Go runtime and the Go runtime decided to kill or stop this particular program and give us th this error message for debugging. So this was a panic which happened because of the Go runtime not knowing what to do. But uh, this uh, is not the only type of panic that can happen in Go programs we could use explicitly the panic function in Go to cause our Go applications to panic as well. So in this short program, I simply have three lines of code. The first one prints the string panic. Uh, in the next line, we are calling Go's inbuilt panic function, which returns us this error message, cannot continue the program, and causes the main function uh, or the Go program to panic. And post that panic, also I have a, a fmt.println statement, which prints the string post panic, but uh, when we try to run the program, we see that the execution never comes to this line and the program simply exits when it encounters a panic function. Because that is exactly the job of a panic function, which is to cause our applications to panic and stop working. We can see though that the application ran correctly uh, until before uh, the panic function, uh, because we can see this string printed here because of this function call here on line number nine. What I want to do here next is modify this code a bit and show you how panic works along with deferred functions. So what is it that we're doing here? We are first printing the string uh, one start, then we are deferring the printing of the string to deferred, then we are causing our application to panic and raise an error with the message that uh, cannot continue the program uh, and we have a string being printed after the panic, which is three post panic. So let us try to see what is the output of this small piece of code. Okay, so what do we have here? We see that the first statement uh, runs correctly. Uh, so we get one start printed. Post that, uh, we all know that since this function is deferred, uh, this function will actually be called before the main function returns or ends. So this two dot deferred is basically not printed here, but is printed later on. Um, uh, next, we cause a panic, which causes the application to panic. But before the main function exits, the deferred function is being called. 
So what this shows us is that when a panic occurs within a function, any functions which might have deferred within that same function will be executed before the panic actually takes place. So the sequence of execution in such cases would be that deferred functions would be executed first, then panics would occur and any statements following the panics would not be executed at all because this function would simply exit after panicking. So I hope now that you have understood how panics and deferred function calls work together. Uh, this uh, behavior is very useful for us because suppose we were closing some open resources using uh, deferred function calls. Uh, those resources would still be closed before our application exits and panics and we won't have leakage of any resources. Next, let me try to show you situations in which we might be interested in causing our applications to panic. So I have very simple code here. We have a string s which is equal to the string 100. We are trying to convert this string into an integer, uh, uh, the base being 10 and the number of bits being 64. And then we are simply trying to print that integer. Uh, so what happens when I try to run this program? Well, I see that our program runs correctly and I see the output of 100 getting printed. Uh, next, what I'll try to do is uh, change this 100 to something say XYZ and when I try to run this program, we see that we get an output of 0 being printed which shows us that even if we provide a semantically wrong value of S in this function, um, it gives us uh, a 0 value of uh, an integer and that is what we see being printed over here. In this situation though, we would also be getting an error returned from the parse in function which we could uh, simply print out. So let's try to run this program. And we see that we get an error strcon.parseInt parsing xyz, the syntax is invalid. Now let us suppose that such an error situation in which we have supplied a semantically wrong value to the parse int function is not acceptable to our Go application. And in that case, we would like to simply stop running our application and exit it. For doing that, we could simply replace the printing of the error with a panic. And let us see what happens in this case. Well, we see that instead of continuing uh, till line number 14, our program simply panics and exits on line number 12 itself. And what happens if we had given the correct semantic value for the string s well in this case we don't see that our application panics and exits because in this case we would not receive any error from the parse and function so this was a sample use case of a situation in which we might want our application to panic this is a very uh, common pattern in go where functions in go would normally not have an opinion about what is and what is not a situation worth panicking for. A Go program would generally just try to execute or do something and it would return us an error if something goes wrong while performing that function. As we could see in the case of giving a input which cannot be passed into a string, the parse and function began returning an error to us. So most library functions will not panic and they will simply return errors and we as developers have to decide whether our applications can continue when we receive such errors or whether our applications need to panic in those cases. And that's all we had to discuss about panicking in Go. All of the code that we just discussed has been updated in this GitHub repository AE Dorado slash learning go the file name being panic.go. So please do check it out as well. And if you found the content of the video helpful, please do hit the like button. If you find the content of my channel helpful, please click subscribe. You can hit the bell icon to never miss any new updates. And like always, thanks a lot for watching and I'll see you very soon in a brand new tutorial.